Welcome to the Sound for Video session. It is March 24th, 2016. And um, today's topic is why mix while recording. So this is a topic that I think a lot of us that are kind of more enthusiast filmmakers don't necessarily understand entirely. <laughs> and um, kind of as I've done some research and talked with other people and uh, been in a couple of situations where this was required, want to talk a little bit about what first of all what is a live mix or you know a, a mix that you would typically do while you're recording um, what it's useful for or, you know what circumstances they usually require it and um, and then whether or not it really kind of fits your particular project or production so let's uh, let's dive into that first of all over on the Google plus page there were a couple of questions that are related to this that I'd like to cover the first one's from kevin steinman why would you uh sorry would you add high pass and compression these are available on my zoom h5 and others i'm sure while recording or wait until post um that one that's a great question kevin i would um it it depends on i guess it depends on a lot of things if you th first of all high pass what a high pass filter is generally useful for is if you are recording, um, you've got the microphone out on a boom pole and you're hand operating it, the high pass filter will help cut off a lot of the handling noise uh, because handling noise usually comes across as this very low frequency kind of rumbly sound. And what a high pass filter will do is actually filter a lot of that out and let everything else pass into the recording. So a high pass filter can be helpful there. You'll want to get to know the high pass filter on your particular recorder um or microphone a lot of microphones have them at least higher end microphones have them um because it's in some cases they're so aggressive that they end up cutting into the bass response of the microphone and so if you want a richer sound especially for dialogue uh, a lot of times that will get cut out so be careful get to know it if, if you like the sound of it and it seems to help in terms of cutting out some of that handling noise or perhaps very light breezes it'll sometimes help a little bit there uh, air conditioners that are running can help there as well, things of that nature. So uh, those are some, some things to consider. On the Zoom H5 in particular, and actually all of the Zoom products of which I'm aware, um, here I happen to have an H4N. Um, but those all have, and the same is true actually of the lower end Tascam recorders, like the DR60D Mark II. Uh, these these recorders implement the high pass filter and in fact the compressors if they have them the zoom products have the compressors tascams usually have a limiter um, those are all implemented in the digital stage and i don't want to get too far into that but those are not going to generally save you <laughs> in terms of uh, preventing clipping they can help you in other ways but they don't generally help in terms of clipping um, this is a debate and I think different people work different ways. So yeah, you certainly can do it while you're recording. I generally don't with these products, with the, with the lower end ones. Um, actually, I take that back on the task cam. I'll usually turn the limiter on, so it'll catch the very most extreme. Uh, and actually it, it, that, well, that's the problem. It won't necessarily catch the most extreme cases. What it will do, it's also implemented in the digital stage. So if the sound coming in is a, extraordinarily loud louder than you had planned it uh, totally overloads and it uh, distorts in the analog stage of the preamplifier once that gets to the digital stage it's con or you know the, the converter it's converted to digital and then the limiter kicks in so at that point it's already too late um, so it's not going to save you from those kind of circumstances however where it can be useful both in terms as a compressor in the zoom h4 and uh, as a limiter in the Tascam is that at that point it can actually pull down any transients. So if you had any little spikes in the, the waveform, it'll, it can pull those down. If they haven't already distorted, it can be a very effective thing to do. It'll save you some time in post is essentially what it will do in managing those um, transients so that you can normalize your audio after that. So I think, Kevin, it really kind of depends. It's up to you. I would ex do some experimenting. I wouldn't wait until a, a, you know, a serious project, <laughs> but do plenty of experimenting first and see if you like the results with those two. But I think, yeah, they can definitely be helpful while recording. Um, I typically 
um, on my Zoom F8, which is my main recorder up until just recently. Now it's, and we'll talk about that in a minute, but my Zoom F8, I will generally leave the limiter on. And um, because that, that one in particular, that recorder has quite a bit of dynamic range. And so that's helpful. High pass filters, I will, uh, depends. If I have one that's fairly subtle, that's not extreme, um, say for example, maybe an 80 Hertz high pass filter, I will often leave that on. On the Tascam, actually it goes uh, the DR60D Mark II, the, you can actually adjust the frequency of the high pass filter and you can actually set it to something like 40 Hertz. And that's really, really mild. And in fact, in those cases, I'll usually leave it on. Um, Zoom F8, I think I almost always leave it on as well. Again, and you can set it pretty low. Um, what you want to do is you want to avoid having a high pass filter that sits at something like 250 hertz, unless you're in an incredibly crazy place where you don't feel like you're going to get any um, audio unless you <laughs> turn on an extreme high pass filter or anything that's usable because there's so much noise down low. Um, I haven't run into those circumstances too much, so don't generally do that. So great question, Kevin. Um, I hope that helps a little bit. IGIS Productions asks, is there any option for mixing while recording in a one-man band production? Any tip for all of us? Well, that's a great question. In fact, that's how I'm usually recording. So we're going to talk about that a little bit. All right. Um, let's talk about, first of all, what is... Um, a mix. What you know? How would you how would you deliver a mix if you were doing the recording for somebody else, or or how would you get it if you were doing it? And to do that, we're going to just look at something here really quickly. There we go. Okay, here we have Adobe Audition, and in Adobe Audition right now, I'm looking at a recording. This is actually just a single microphone recording, but you can see we have three channels, first, second, and third channels here. It turns out that what these first two channels are is actually the stereo mix. And then this third channel here is the recording of the single microphone that I recorded. Now you'll you'll notice a few things about this. So, so this is the, the microphone here. This is the left channel of the stereo mix. And this is the right channel of the stereo mix. And I didn't really do a lot of mixing here. There's a little bit you can see here. Like, for example, right in this area here, you can see this is a lot hotter than it is in the original microphone recording. Um, but other than that, it's pretty similar. Not a lot of differences. I didn't do any live mixing here, really, but I just wanted to illustrate how this works. So in a in in the bigger budget productions, let me just explain why these are typically used. Um, in bigger bu budget productions, um, particularly in cases, well, traditionally, and in case, especially in cases where there is a very fast turnaround expected on the edit, um, that is to say, it's maybe for a TV show that's shot one day and it's going to air the next day. Um, the or, or even for a live production, uh, it's a little different in a live production, so we're not going to talk about that. But <laughs> um, but if you have a fast turnaround, typically the workflow is going to work like this. You actually do the recording. Say, for example, you're the, the field mixer. Um, you would come in, you would do the recording, and while you're recording, you would be adjusting the faders on your recorder or your mixer. And you'd actually be making a mix here that would be something that they could use without having to do a whole lot of editing. Um, that's that's kind of the main idea. And um, so if there's a fast turnaround, what they would do is in the edit, they would come in and just grab the stereo track here, the left and right channels of the mix that you've already done, and say there were maybe four mics on the production. Um, you would mix those mics, and they could actually pretty much just pull out the stereo mix here and run with that. Pull, pull that into their edit, nonlinear editor, along with all of the video clips. And they would just edit from that. They wouldn't bother with the isolated tracks that you've also recorded. So that's one scenario where you might use it. Another scenario is um, in a, say for example, you're shooting a feature film or even a short film there was a drama and say, for example, you had two lavalier mics or maybe three lavalier mics and a boom mic. Um, 
you might do a mix in that case as well. Um, in that case, they wouldn't probably use the stereo mix as the final audio, but what they would do is when they're doing their original edit of the overall picture, they would use the stereo mix as sort of the temp audio or the temp dub. And um, what they would do is they would edit to that and then they would pass the overall pin, the finished or the cut piece back over to the sound department and the sound department would then mix in, they would remove the stereo tracks piece by piece and instead insert the isolated tracks that have been edited and that have been um, sort of mastered and finished a little bit. So that's how it's going to work on a, you know, a more traditional um, sort of piece as far, as far as feature films and even short films are concerned when you have a dedicated sound group, sound post group, I should say. So those are some considerations. So for the dailies, if, if you're shooting dailies, they would use the stereo mix. And then for the finished piece, they'd probably actually go back to the isolated tracks and use those. So hopefully that makes sense there. So those are kind of the circumstances where those are used. And, and, and I think what it really comes down to is that um, for solo shooters or one man bands like many of us are, the kind of the, the utility would be in something that you could turn around a little bit more quickly and potentially save yourself some time in post. Those are where we're more likely to use a stereo mix. So. So that's the first thing. So understanding that, that can help you understand, okay, first of all, why do they ever do these mixes? Um, second of all, does it make sense in your particular production? And frankly, in a lot of cases, um, I sometimes I'll use them and sometimes I won't. And in fact, I almost never end up using the stereo mix in, in, in the final piece, I should say. I do, I do record them and I do use them in post sometimes, um, but a lot of times I end up going to the isolated tracks so that I can control things a little bit more. Um, but that takes more time in post. So it's all a big, it's all a big uh, sort of trade-off, I guess. So that's what a stereo mix is. Um, let me just talk about uh, where it's feasible and where it's not. I think for example, with something like a Zoom H4n, it's not a very feasible thing to do because um, pretty much is you have one rocker switch on the side called rec level, <laughs> that's your record level. And uh, it's not very feasible to try and mix something with, like that in a live situation. Oh, some other thoughts uh, actually before we move on to that too much. Um, another reason that sometimes you will want to do a mix is that in a mix when you're when you're actually doing it and actually let me show you a proper uh, recorder here so you can see how this is feasible one second here so here you have a sound devices 633 and you can see here on this um, here you have your gain gain trim, and then here you have a fader. So in those kind of circumstances, it's a lot more feasible to do uh, actual mixing <laughs> live. And the reason again, well, actually one other reason that I didn't mention before for where you might want to do this is that um, one benefit is also you can actually pull the fader back on channels on microphones that aren't currently being used. So overall, you get end up with a quieter recording. And I mean quieter, not only in terms of the self noise that the microphone's producing, and actually that's not as much of it, but more the noise that the actors may be producing on set. Um, so that's another thing, another benefit of doing a mix, especially again, if the, um, the mix is something that's actually going to be used either for dailies or um, even in the final production. Also, you can reduce phase issues. Remember over the last couple of weeks, we've talked a little bit about phase and comb filtering. If you have multiple mics on set and an actor is closer to one, their lavalier mic versus the boom mic, um, if you want, um, or say for example, here, consider this scenario, you have two people and they are both have lavalier mics and then you also have a boom mic. Well, when this person is talking, 
this person's lav mic is also picking up this person. So you might want to pull the fader back on this person's mic while this person is talking so that in that stereo mix, you don't get the phase issues. So because um, then you'd have both tracks recording the same thing, but this mic would be capturing the sound a few milliseconds after this mic does. And then you would get that comb filtering effect and that sort of that strangeness that comes along with that. So that's where you would want to pull again trying to keep these hands straight because they're different than <laughs> it's backwards. So again, if this person's talking, you'd pull this person's microphone down with a fader and you would record less of them. So I hope that makes sense as well. There's another reason. So um, we've established the Zoom H4 is not a very feasible one to do uh, any sort of mixing on. Tascam, on the other hand, you could do because you do have the fader over here. They're not very easy to work with. They're very small, a little bit on the flimsy side. Um, but that you could potentially do it with a Tascam recorder like that. Uh, Zoom F8, um, just in the most recent firmware, the version two firmware, they actually changed these. Um, these were originally just gain trims, but they actually now are can be switched to, to work as faders as well. You can mix on these as well, but they also have the iPad app, which, uh, or actually iOS app, I should say, which means you could mix on your phone or on your iPad. And actually, considering the size of these little potentiometers on the device itself, it's a lot easier to, to use the iPad app um, or even the phone app to do the mixing as opposed to using these on the front. Um, but you can switch them over on the front of the device and actually use them as faders as well. So you could mix on something like that. The ultimate though, um, well actually this is not the ultimate I should say, but if you're going to use the faders built into the device, I think these on the sound devices 633 are much, much easier to work with. Um, they're really made for that purpose. This is a mixer um, <laughs> in a lot of different ways that we'll talk about. I'm working on a review of this one. So this is now my primary recorder. Um, and mixer, but uh, I will be keeping the F8 as my sort of my backup recorder as well. So there's just, those are some thoughts, uh, first of all, on kind of the very nuts and bolts of, of mixing itself and why you might want to do it or might not want to do it. Now, I'm not here to suggest that you need to be doing this. This is not for a lot of us that are enthusiast filmmakers and we're, we're, we're operating the camera, we're directing, we're operating sound. Um, we have a lot going on, and it's going to be really tough to do a mix. Um, but in terms of the question that IGS, IGIS Productions asked, I would say um, what I typically do, if I'm operating solo, if I'm shooting only one camera and, I'm, and it's a static shot, I have it locked off on a tripod, I may just operate sound during the actual take. Um, and, and honestly, then... Um, I may do a mix, but again, for the corporate video pieces that I do, they're usually pretty straightforward. It's not usually a lot of mixing that needs to be done. This, uh, this last weekend, um, I did shoot a live music show and it was a very simple act. It was just a really, um, frankly, it was my wife <laughs> playing violin on stage um, while my daughter danced some traditional Irish music. So in that case, I got a, a mix, or sorry, a, it actually was a mix. It was a stereo mix from the soundboard. The guy that was operating the soundboard there let me get a feed from the soundboard. Um, it was just two channels, one mic for her fiddle and another mic for, she had another mic to talk in between pieces. And so it was a very straightforward mix and I could easily, you know, I just had one camera set up. So in between, I wasn't operating, I wasn't panning the camera or anything back and forth across the stage. And then uh, in between, the actual musical pieces, um, I would just fade down the violin microphone and fade up the vocal mic and then do the inverse once she went back to playing a piece. So, you know, those, those are very simple things. And that's something you can do as a single operator. Now, a lot of times I'll have two cameras going. And again, if they're locked off shots where I'm not having to operate camera and pan and tilt and all that sort of thing, um, then I may just stand at the recorder and actually, or the mixer and actually do some kind of light mixing while that's going on. So those are some thoughts. I would say this mixing, if you're operating as a solo operator is not necessarily a luxury that you get <laughs> and that's okay. I think it's just helpful to understand why you 
you know, why it's done in some circumstances and why you might not want to do it in some circumstances. So there are some things there, some considerations. Okay, um, let's go back and look at this audio again that um, I showed you before this, this actual mix that we have. Okay, again, here we're back in Adobe Audition. A um, couple of things you'll note. This is actually the very first recording that I made. I just received my sound devices 633 earlier this week. Um, and it's kind of unique in a lot of ways. And it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty interesting to start working with a, a kind of a mixer in this range as opposed to kind of the more prosumer type recorders. Just, again, not that I'm um, trying to say, hey, how awesome this is or, you know, whatever, but more of a how it's different, how these pro devices are a little bit different than what we're used to on the prosumer end on things like Zoom recorders or Tascam, the Tascam recorders. At least the Tascam actually does have a high-end professional sort of cart-based um, recorder or mixer as well but um but most of their most of what they're selling i think are the the more prosumer type recorders like the dr 60d and the 70d and the 701d and those types um but what you'll notice here first of all is um the peaks here ex with this exception of this section right here where i was actually testing the limiter on the 633 you can see they don't peak very high that's one thing that was kind of interesting to me when i first saw it let me just give you a higher contrast view of it you can see most of the peaks are sitting here uh, minus 15 and lower, actually. Probably more in the minus 18 range if I had to kind of look at that. So that's one thing that kind of struck me at the first. Um, also, the meters on the device itself are actually dBU meters instead of dB full scale meters. And uh, we'll talk about that more in the future and what the difference is. but. DBU meters are the types of meters that you typically see on analog mixers. Um, so like a soundboard at a concert, those, those meters are a little bit different. And typically there, what you're doing is you're aiming to get the peaks hitting zero DBU as opposed to on a full scale or DB full scale meter, which is typically what you have on things like a, a Tascam recorder or a Zoom recorder, um, where you're actually trying to get the peaks to hit somewhere closer to if you're mixing for recording, at least, you're generally aiming to get the peak somewhere closer to minus 12 dB. So that's the first thing that's kind of interesting. So when on the analog meters, the dBU meters on the sound devices, when you have those hitting about zero dB, this is what the recording is going to look like. So it's only going to peak in a digital full scale range. It's only going to be peaking somewhere in the probably the minus 15 probably minus 15 range. They're pretty conservative on that. And it's not a problem there because these preamps are actually extraordinarily quiet. So <laughs> it was kind of kind of interesting. Um, so that means in, in post, you have plenty of room to normalize this, plenty of headroom to normalize it, and still come out with an extraordinarily quiet recording. Uh, quiet recording in terms of the silent parts, I should say. So a, a noise-free um, recording in terms of any sort of noise produced by the microphone and the um, anything in the signal chain and the recorder itself. So that actually works out pretty well. It's a little bit of a different experience, but again, kind of a, a thing that I'm, I'm new at in terms of the, the whole mixing thing um, while recording. And it's kind of interesting getting used to the, the new way of doing things here. So I hope that was, uh, we're coming kind, kind of to the end here. I hope that was helpful for you in answering any sort of questions or thoughts, or even if it wasn't something you were wondering about, hopefully helpful for you in terms of um, just understanding how the larger productions generally work and why they work that way. And uh, per perhaps giving you a little context so that when you're working on your projects, if there are circumstances where it makes sense to do some sort of mix, um, now you understand the value and the benefits, at least at a high level of what those are. Now, I will say this, it takes a lot of practice to be a good mixer. <laughs> and I'm not a good mixer yet. Um, but uh, now that you understand that, um, again, it would be a case where just like we've talked about in the past, for especially for those who are enrolled in the course, um, you would still set up your gain staging the same. So here on the Tascam recorder, it kind of illustrates it very nicely. Setting your gain is actually something you do over in the menu. 
and then you just have your faders while you're actually recording where you would do the micro the, i guess the the fine tune adjustments and uh, that's the same thing same way it generally works when you're mixing on any sort of device um, the same thing here again uh, you would first set the gain uh, kind of backwards there you'd set the gain here and then while you're actually rolling then you would just use the fader to kind of fine tune things like that is the main idea all right well we um we're coming here to the end i wanted to thank everyone for the questions thanks kevin and thanks igis productions for your questions today if uh if you're in the course and you do have any questions you're you know you're welcome to contact me anytime via email um, for everyone else, I would definitely encourage you to contact me on either my YouTube channel or on the Google Plus page. If you have questions, love to, to hear those and uh, talk about them in a future session. Thanks again, everybody, and we'll talk to you again next week.